Hello, and welcome once again to the House of Bob. I am your host, Sean, and today we are starting a brand new campaign. We're going to be playing Pathfinder 2nd Edition. This is a slightly newer game, a couple of years at this point, based in a sword and sorcery type setting, just like Dungeons and Dragons, which you may be familiar with. There are some little tweaks to the rules that make it its own kind of beast, and we are very excited to take you through it today. We're going to be playing a pre-made module called Carrion Hill that I am converting from the first edition of Pathfinder to the second edition. And let me tell you, it's a lot of work, so you better appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Joining me today are the players of House on Carrion Hill. So let's start with Dan. What do you want to know? How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. I'm great. Dan, tell us who your character is. I will be playing Will and Dappen. He is a gnome wizard. That's all you need to know right now. Good, good, cool. <laughs> Jeanette. You might know Jeanette from some of our Patreon shows and the Oasis Down series, but welcome to Jeanette to our, our regular uh, long-form campaign. Tell us, Jeanette, who are you playing? Welcome to Jeanette. <laughs> <laughs> Dot com. I'm going to be playing um, Bimkin Nedobrisen. He's a long snout rat folk. He's an oracle. And I gave you one more thing than Dan, so I feel like that's fair. There you go. Yeah, just add on every time. Yeah. We'll get to Trevor and he'll have to tell us an essay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Oracle, for those at home who do not know, is a class that is unique. Pathfinder was created for the first edition of the game. It's kind of like a warlock version of a cleric instead of a warlock version of a wizard, if you're familiar with fifth edition. Next up, we have Schubert. Schubert, tell us about your character. I'm Schubert. And I am playing Nibnub. And Nibnub is a goblin fighter. He's a razor tooth goblin fighter. Ooh. He's a twitchy, bitey, but ultimately lovable goblin. Nice. And that brings us, of course, to the final member of our crew today, Trevor. Hello. Hi. Hi. Who are you playing? <laughs> I will be playing an orc named Theobald. My orc has come from the Hold Scarred heritage line. He has tattoos and a third eye. He's tall and very steady. He used to be an owner of a bar. He was a barkeep. And he is looking for something. Oh, 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 oh. But he's not quite sure what he's looking for right now. So he's a, an orc investigator. So he's somebody that has just made a career out of looking for things. There we go. And so Investigator is another new class from Pathfinder that those who uh, are interested in things like Sherlock Holmes, this is your class for sure. Pathfinder 2nd Edition has some major differences from Dungeons & Dragons that we will get into. We are starting the game at 5th level. This is a 5th level module. We're going to uh, run into all sorts of roadblocks and bumps along the road as we figure out how to play 5th level characters, Having some of us now having never played Pathfinder second edition before. So don't worry, it'll be fun. And without further ado, let's get started. Fade to black. In the blackness of a dark, wet cave, torchlight reflects off of slimy rock walls and uneven floors, draping two running figures in jittery shadows. They're barreling through at a breakneck pace, dodging clusters of stalagmites and slipping across calcite flows. The man in front, holding a dying torch aloft, looks over his shoulder, and we see panic in his eyes. He doesn't slow down as he urges his companion, Hurry, Ingrid! Hurry! In his haste, he doesn't see a low-hanging stalactite in his path. He cracks his head on it and collapses to the ground. The torch goes spinning wildly off down the tunnel to skitter on the floor. Ingrid barely steps behind him, stumbles and hops to try to avoid the man. She trips and falls over him with a pained scream. The man, lying on the ground, struggles to his knees, vomits, and then slowly clambers to his feet and stumbles dizzily to her side. The woman, lying face down, gurgles a whisper. They... they got me, Oleg. Oleg looks down at the woman's back and sees a black shaft of a stone stalagmite has pierced through her chain mail, impaling her. Blood is pooling across the slick, rocky floor. Oleg reaches out and touches the stalagmite, feeling down to her side where the black blood flows around the wound. He strains to see the ground and the walls of the cavern around them, shudders and shivers. Suddenly, a loud laugh echoes through the tunnel. 
It's a slimy, condescending laugh that makes Oleg cringe and duck his head. A voice follows the laughter from the darkness. Mousies, mousies, my rhyme. Come and play, little mousies. Oleg covers his ears, lying in the fetal position next to his dying companion. She stirs a little, reaches her hand out to him. Oleg, t -t take take it. Oleg begins to shake his head, protesting, No, no, no. It'll, it'll, it'll make you, make you rich. She manages to choke out these last few words while sliding a black leather-bound home across the slick floor. Mouses. Oleg, wide-eyed, anxiously scans the tunnel behind him, seeing nothing but blackness. He grabs the book and runs. Fade to black. Insert title card, House on Carrion Hill. Carrion Hill is a bedraggled and filthy, yet strangely resolute city. It has stood for centuries, at least. Some venture that the city has always been here, sitting astride the Kingfisher River in the county of Versex in the eastern region of the immortal Principality of Ustalov. It's a mouthful. Carrion Hill, however, seems to have always been its name, ever since it was a pile of standing stones worshipped by strange Kelid tribespeople, conquered by nation after nation but to outsiders and foreigners, sometimes known as the Wart. The Wart looms forebodingly above the moors, mist and fog enshrouding its base. The towers of Rag Manor and the ossuary church pierce the gray sky, trudging along a muddy road, seemingly the only travel heading to town on this dismal day, is a small gnome in brightly colored clothing. Dan, tell us about this gnome. What does he look like? Where is he coming from? How does he feel about the wart? He's definitely full of stuff. He has a huge pack on his back that's way too big for him. Overstuffed. He has a lot of crazy colors on. And he has these interesting looking glasses that kind of hide the color of his natural eye colors. And how does he feel about the wart? You see this massive, massive city on a hill that like spills down mm -hmm. into this marshland. And right now you're walking through all this farmland. You see a few people uh, out there tilling the ground or working with various grains. There's some cows over in the field to your left. But it's a very dismal day. There's lots of mist and fog. And you can see the gates of the city rising up ahead of you. Yeah, d despite that, he's still uh, he's still in good spirits. Um, he's definitely impressed. He's never seen a city this large before. He's actually picked up his pace and he's trying to get there sooner than he can. So, so as your feet uh, speed, speed your way, Willen quickly comes to the gates of the city, guarded by two uh, sort of lazy-looking guards dressed in black cloaks and steel helms. They bear the symbol of the city, which is basically a large tower. And as you come forward, they step up to you. Uh, hi, hi, hello, traveler. Uh, welcome. Uh, you're here to celebrate the, the days of frost, I see. Yes. Welcome, welcome. Well, the festival is uh, quickly going to begin. I welcome you. Uh, just uh, get you to sign in this this charter here, this this register. Uh, your name and occupation, please. Well, why do you need that? Well, just a registry of who comes and goes. It's a busy time this time of year with the Day of Bones approaching. And we need to make sure that, uh, you know, should anything strange happen, we can track down those who, uh, who've been in the city. Oh, all right. Well... Willen Dappen's the name. Willen Dappen. Uh, yes, thank you. And your occupation, sir? Uh, town wizard? I guess. I've never really put a label on it. Town <laughs> wizard. Oh, yeah. We had a, a, one or two of those already today. Uh, nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, not knowing the name of your profession. Why would I be ashamed? I don't know. <laughs> Just something I thought I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, that was, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, anyways, you can you can go in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, and uh, heads on through the gate. We travel now to the docks, the plankways and canals of a part of the city called the Filth, Carrion Hill's lowest district. There's a few barges trolling the muck, and the men upon them wearing mud-caked overalls and oiled hoods probe the flotsam for treasures. There's a lone raft piloted by two dirty children, it glides up to a stop at the docks and lets its lone passenger off. 
a stout yet tiny goblin. Tell us about this character, Schubert. All right, so Nibnub, like you said, he's uh, stout, as in very strong. You notice that his uh, right arm is just extremely muscular, and uh, he's holding on to what appears to be a stick tied to a fork, with possibly still some extra food left over from earlier. He's green, a nice shade of green. Whatever shade of green you think is the nicest, that's what he is. <laughs> but you can clearly see that he's uh, he looks nervous. His head keeps swinging around really quickly, and he looks like he's worried about danger from anywhere and extremely suspicious. I think you'd probably also notice he's wearing some kind of device around his mouth area that looks like it might enhance his uh, biting capabilities. It's like made out of scrap metal and that kind of thing. A big jaw piece. Mm -hmm. For his armor, he's also kind of wearing what looks like probably some like cookware that was just like hastily thrown together with some leather straps. Like I said, one big muscly arm and where the other arm would be, you just see a small kind of stitched up patch. A stump. A one-armed goblin walks off the raft and onto the dock. And the little boy who helped pilot the raft in squeaks up. Oi, you! With the, with the green skin, you gotta pay us. What? Pay? With money? Yeah. We, we brought you across the river, you gotta pay us. Okay. How much? Uh, two silver pieces. Um... Okay, I think, I guess that sounds reasonable. I don't really know. Um, it's perfectly reasonable, actually. Uh, okay. Nibnov just reaches into a uh, backpack on his back, and he has to sort through quite a bit of junk, but uh, eventually he reaches some money kind of spilled haphazardly at the bottom and picks out a couple silver pieces. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, if you ever need a ride back again, you can trust us. Uh, just uh, ask for the, the Wisley brothers. And they turn and push their raft back out into the filth. You turn around, you see all these plankways and docks. They're kind of like this rat's nest of tangled wooden planks and a maze of pathways basically across this mud and water port, essentially. You can see the buildings of the city rising ahead of you, and you see that there's actually quite a crowd out on the ground or the land on the other side of the, the plankways. Awesome. Nib Nub doesn't care too much about the dirt at all. In fact, I think he'll probably walk through some mud puddles just to, you know, just to get that nice mud feeling on his feet again. He kind of likes being dirty, so he revels in it. All right. <laughs> Nib Nub <laughs> cools his feet on his way back to ground. Uh, across all the plankways. Of course, there's a couple guys out there like crawling the mud with nets and like occasionally they'll pull something up and inspect it and try and like rinse some of it off and shake their heads, throw it back. They'll mm. swish something else up and they'll all of a sudden like four or five of these like homeless looking muddy guys run over and they'll be like, that's mine, I saw it first. <laughs> oh man, Nimnov's getting hungry, I think. He's just licking his <laughs> lips, imagining what kind of gross thing they could be hauling in. It's definitely, <laughs> definitely something gross. She's just imagining that delicious, stinky fish. Totally. <laughs> As the docks meld into the muddy street at the edge of the water, it becomes substantially more crowded. People of various sizes, ancestries, and creeds all mill about, chatting and trading. Many of them wear masks, actually, styled to look like skulls. Some of them are humanoid skulls, some of them are animalistic. We see a larger figure stop in front of a stall selling masks, examining the wares. A tall, orcish man. Trevor, tell us about this guy. This guy is Theobald, and Theobald is quite tall. A sturdy, tall tree of an orc, wearing sort of drab, unassuming, dreary-toned garments over top of studded leather armor with ornamental tattoos peeking out where bare skin shows and two glistening yellow-white tusks protrude from 
Theobald's face. Probably the th most alarming quality of Theobald is his third eye, placed squarely in his forehead. The sort of legs as his eyes, the two regular ones, gaze over items, looking at masks, looking at patrons, looking at just about every little thing, looking for details. And the third eye lazily follows what the two former eyes lead with. Ooh. So it's a it's a lazy third eye. It's a lazy third <laughs> eye. <laughs> that seems really unfortunate. <laughs> it eventually catches up. It's just sort of like lingering on its way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Still one better than any of us. I mm -hmm. mean <laughs> <laughs> it's that extra eye that's just taking in a little bit extra information. Mm. Learning a little bit more about its surroundings. It's, it's taking its time. Exactly. I like that. The mask salesman looks up at you. Hey, uh, orc man, a, a, a mask for, for the Day of Bones, something to wear to honor for asthma. Perhaps you like an eagle mask. Oh, I have this one. It looks like a cat. Theobald takes the cat mask from the salesperson and holds it up close to his face. Yes, compliments your color places the mask up against his face and looks through it at the salesperson and nods. Takes out some change and just gives the shopkeep two silver pieces. Oh, oh thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a generous... Uh, perhaps I could... Um, yes, uh, hold on. And he uh, looks beneath his, his drawer or is behind his stall, pulls out the little drawer and comes back up with a tangle of shells attached to a string. This necklace will go along with it quite well. Uh, please, I, I insist you take it. Thank you. Theobald puts on the, the shells and the mask and just starts wearing the mask around the street. Theobald, with his mask on, uh, looks around the street, and you can see that there are, in fact, quite a few people wearing similar masks. And while it's not like carnival out, there are people who are in a festive state of mind. They're going about, and you can see some new mothers with babies being congratulated on their births. You can see a few people dressed in mourning black being uh, consoled by friends. Everyone together in, in both states of, of joy and mourning are, are working their way through the streets, visiting stalls, buying food, and just chatting with each other. And then a little further away, in the twisted mass of narrow alleys, dead-end streets, and dark, covered streets, an area of the city known as the Tangles District, a door slams shut as a small figure scurries out of grocers. The small figure is kind of a rat person? Jeanette, tell us about, tell us about this person. This person is not a person, it's a rat folk. His name is Bimkin Nedobrisen, and he's kind of disheveled looking like Almost like a rat that hasn't like washed itself in a couple of days. So his like fur is kind of all over the place. He's like a darker color. And then he's got uh, like robes, but it looks like he's wearing some sort of like bulkier items underneath. So it's like it's not quite fitting to his figure. You can kind of see like bulges in different areas where he might have things stashed. And he's wearing pinstriped pants and then a long reddish robe and a gold um, necklace with the pendant hangs down in the front and he's scurrying along and every so often whatever he's holding in his hand he just suddenly drops it and then scurries to pick it up again like he's just rushing too much you uh hear a voice from the grocers say don't come back <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay <laughs> bimkin makes his way down the street and you can hear in the distance the sound of the festival kind of spinning up for the day and you come around a corner and there's a huge crowd of people all milling about. There are uh, humans and halflings, and there's even an orc in the distance, kind of probably weave between legs and, and whatever. And you uh, suddenly stop as you feel a tug at the back of your robe. I turn around. There's no one there, strangely enough. But in the distance, maybe 30, 40 feet away from you, you see kind of all by itself the side of the square a little card table set up with a sheet draped over it and a halfling man sitting behind the table. He's got a big handlebar mustache and a large scarf piled high on top of his head 
and he's shuffling a deck of cards, and he locks eyes with you. He says, um, you there, you there. Uh, yes, come, come one, come see. I have a, a Harrow reading for you. Your future, your, 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 everything you need to know about anything there is to know about. Come now, come now, hear your fortune. He kind of like looks around to see if there's anybody else and then and points to himself. Is me? Yes, you. Yes, come. See your fortune. Learn what there is to learn. Okay, but I don't believe this much, but all right. I, I come over. Ah, you know, there is much to learn. You may not be a believer now, but uh, trust me, uh, the more that you see, the more likely you are to believe. Uh, tell me, is there uh, some question that that bothers you on this, the Day of Bones. Do you have a question of a phrasma? A question of the fates? Uh, no, I'm pretty sure that I... When things uh, should happen for me, they will happen. It is a matter of patience, friend. The cards cannot tell you this. Ah, but they can tell you perhaps which path you should take, or will your pa- patience pay off, or perhaps you should move on to something new. Uh, a simple reading can give you much insight. Uh, just simply ask a single silver piece, sir. All right. If I go back to Grocer, will he recognize me? That's your question. Will the Grocer <laughs> recognize you? Yes. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, one simple, simply just place a silver piece on the table, sir. He uh, reaches into one pocket and then, like, kind of pulls out some, like, white fluffies. He's like, oh, no. And then he goes through another one and, like, pulls out some string. And then he finally finds a silver piece and puts it down. Aha. Good, good, good. And he begins to shuffle the deck and, and riffles it back and forth and... Uh, the cards dance from one hand to the other, and he lays out an elaborate pattern of cards face down. He reaches out and he's, Your future lies beneath this card. Your past lies beneath this card. Your present lies here. And all of the myriad of choices in between. Allow me to tell you. And he goes to flip the first card over, and you hear a yell behind you. In fact, all of you hear a yell. There is a town guardsman with a big steel helm and a big black cloak holding another halfling by the ankle up in the air, just behind Bimkin. The halfling struggles and screams, says, Let me go, let me go, I didn't do nothing. The guard says, You absolutely did. You robbed that rat folk there. I saw it happen. You're going to be giving him back his money. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. And these two begin to have an argument in the street right behind Bimkin. A small crowd begins to gather around. I show up as well. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to watch with great interest. <laughs> you guys see as this argument begins to escalate. And I'm going to have everybody roll a perception check. Ooh. Nimno doesn't really want to get involved. But as soon as he sees people being aggressive, he's just like instinctively wants to get in there. 24 for Bimkin. So 11 for Willen. Theobald got a 22. Just 18 for Nim Nim. Bimkin, you look at this halfling as he's dangling there and you kind of pat your pockets and sure enough, something's missing and you turn back to the table and as you turn back to the table, just in time, you see the halfling fortune teller scurrying away at full speed. Um, I'm going to chase him. All right. So Bimkin gives pursuit as this guard deals with the halfling thief. Bimkin runs after the fortune teller. He immediately dives into an alleyway, and we're in a chase. A chase takes place anytime got some people trying to catch up or escape from another people. It's a skill challenge, so you're going to be rolling an athletics check, and you want to be able to surpass your opponent's athletics check. Oh, Bimkin got a nine. The halfling runs around the corner, immediately dives into the dark, twisty alleys. Bimkin follows after. It's barely moments of running down this alley before the twists and turns and low ceilings and debris back here leave you completely disoriented. You stand for a second, looking around, not seeing anything, when suddenly you hear a scream, a blood curling scream, and it echoes through the alleys and out into the square. Yikes. I just heard it? Everybody heard it, actually. Oh. Yeah. And the guy's gone. Guy's gone. The blood curling scream would probably cause a crowd to like pause for a moment. Yeah, they all kind of freeze. And the guard is holding on to the halfling. Um, 
I'm kind of busy with this guy. And he looks around for other guards to back him up and currently sees no one. Theobald takes off his cat mask and walks up to the guard and says, how can I help? You look like your hands are full. <laughs> you could say that again. I've been trying to catch this one all day. Uh, that scream, I'm not sure where it... I think it came from the alleys over there. Can you check it out? You look like you could handle a, handle yourself. Yes, I uh, feel like the other halfling that ran in there may be somehow related to this one. Just a hunch of some kind. If you bring back a second thief, there's a reward in it for you. That's what I like oh, to hear. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Willie, not, not realizing he's not talking to him, just runs off in the direction. Okay. All right, well, Theobald keeps up with um, with Willen. <laughs> so a gnome and a half orc, or a gnome and a full orc, uh, run into the alleyways as well. What's Nimnub up to? Well, he was really excited by all the excitement of the crowd, but I think when he sees these other guys, like, bolt off in another direction, he's kind of equally excited by that, and he just starts... He has no idea what's going on, by the way, but he is going to chase after them. All right. So everybody uh, is running through the alleys at this point, trying to find the source of this scream. I'm going to have you guys roll a survival to make your way through the alleys. Theobald rolls a, a five. Bimkin got 14. 17 for Willen. Nibnub got a nine. So Nibnub and Theobald end up following behind this gnome, Willen, as he easily ducks beneath the overhangs and laundry lines and dodges around garbage and through these narrow alleys and squeezes through between these buildings that are just way too close together. And at about the same time that Bimkin breaks through into this little opening in the alleys where there's some dumpsters and some muck off to the side, you see the halfling, his turban cast off to the side, his fake mustache half hanging off of his face, currently pinned up against a wall by a large, muscular, maybe human, completely skinless, and blood drips off the muscles. This person is twitching as if they're constantly feeling needles poke into them. Their head whips back and forth and it screams into this halfling's face. Stay away from me! Stay out of my dreams! And you can see that he's squeezing and choking the halfling's neck. Yikes. Nimnub's gonna bite it. <laughs> Alright, let's roll for initiative. Alright, so... Pathfinder 2nd Edition works thusly. You have three actions on your turn. Most things cost one action, such as moving your speed, making a single attack, sometimes doing an easy spell, or doing something like grabbing somebody or trying to trip them. It's all just one action. Spells can cost one, two, or three actions, depending on how powerful or how far-reaching their effects may be. You also have a reaction in which you can act or interrupt something that's happening on somebody else's turn. To start combat off, this flayed person squeezing on the halfling's neck pinches, 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 and he's still giving that pain sort of scream. He drops the halfling to the ground, turns, sees you, and yells, the beast rears up, devours the sun, I'm blind, I'm blind, the wolf has taken my eyes. And he reaches up and gouges his own eyes out. Ugh. Oh, jeez. It is Nib Nub's turn. Wow, that's a lot to take in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you see this guy standing over, now standing over this collapsed halfling body. And mm -hmm. you can actually see that the halfling is wavering in and out of consciousness. Mm. He's clutching his left shoulder and... Looks like he's turning kind of blue. Oh, man. Nibnub, I think, would feel some... I don't know if it's pity, but I, I think he he might feel some kind of empathy for uh, the goblin and... Or <laughs> the goblin. The halfling. Uh, see, I'm already seeing him as myself. <laughs> and he's really freaked out by this thing. So Nibnub sees this freaky-looking guy, and his first instinct is to bite. So he's going to run over and try to put this thing out of its misery. 
Okay. So it's about 30 feet to get to him, so that's probably two move actions for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Leaving you one action remaining. All right. Well, then, yeah, I'll get right up into this skinless guy's face. And uh, I just assume this kind of guy should not be long for this world. So I I feel like I'm doing him a mercy. I just try to run up and uh, bite on his neck, I guess. All right. Nim Nub goes for the jugular. (laughs) Classy. Yeah, I kind of have to crawl up him to do it a bit. (laughs) Here goes nothing. I rolled a four, so not great. But I have a plus 16 to hit, so 20 total. All right. A 20 does miss. You're climbing up this flayed person, trying to get to his neck, chomping with your jaws, but you're not able to land a blow that really has any good effect on him. Next up, we have Will and Dappin. So I get right up beside Nibnub, kind of adjacent to this weird, scary dude. And I like lean over to Nibnub. I'm like, this is my first fight. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get to level five? <laughs> <laughs> Mostly just healing people. <laughs> A lot of really easy side quests. Yeah. 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 I've never used this before. And then he cast Lightning Bolt. <laughs> what? <laughs> a Lightning Bolt rips through the alleyway and into the building behind. <laughs> He's going to make a reflex save. Yeah, reflex 21. Okay, so I got a 23, which uh. is a success. So on most damaging spells like this, you're rolling what's called a basic reflex save. On a fail, you take the full damage. On a success, you take half damage. On a critical success, and critical successes and failures in Pathfinder 2nd Edition just means you beat the DC by 10 or failed by 10. So if I had rolled a 31 somehow, I would have taken no damage. Because I rolled just above, I take half. So 14. So this lightning rips into him and he he screams, The sky's open! The sky's open! Not realizing the the full extent of the spell he just unleashed, he probably goes flying back like five feet. (laughs) (laughs) Just lands on his ass. Yeah, he doesn't know how to base himself for casting lightning bolts, so he'll be prone if that matters. All right. Limited power. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Totally. All right, Theobald. Theobald, with his keen eyes, recognizes what's happening right here and he's going to as an action cast devise a stratagem where he plays out the battle in his mind and he's sort of considering the fact that this guy doesn't have any eyes he doesn't have any skin yeah he isn't planning on being here for very long if he was planning at all so uh theobald wants to try and cut him down basically following the goblin's pursuit so do I need to roll anything for device stratagem, the special action? You do. You're rolling uh, just a d20, basically. The way device stratagem works, it's a, an investigator ability. Mm-hmm. You assess a foe's weakness in combat and use them to formulate a plan of attack against your enemy. You pick a creature, you roll a d20. If you later strike that creature in this round, you use the result of that d20 as your roll. But instead of attacking with your strength or dexterity modifier, you can use your intelligence, I think. Okay, so I want to do that. Theobald rolled a 15. Do I add my intelligence modifier to that? So basically you're going to add your attack bonus to that. So let's say you're attacking with your hand wraps. You're you're punching him. You're going to add 13 to that. (laughs) Okay. But your intelligence is too higher than your strength. So you're actually adding 15 to that. Excellent. As an action, can I walk up to him and hit him? Is that too many actions? It's 20 feet away, so you can get there. All right, so yeah, I ran up to him. I'm not going to punch him with my striking hand wraps of mighty blows. Okay. How much damage does Theobald inflict? Mm. So you deal seven points of bludgeoning damage, and anytime you use Devise a Stratagem, you also deal an additional 2d6 precision damage. Oh, sweet. Plus an additional four. Tell me about how you're punching him. After Willen casts this crazy lightning bolt, Theobald's obviously taken back by this horrifying sight, runs past a thrown back Willen, 
and just like winds up and clocks this skinless, eyeless fella right in the middle of his body, just punches him as hard as he can, hoping to send this poor soul crippling to the ground. The flayed man rocks back from the force of Theobald's massive blow. He staggers a bit, his eyeless head swiveling back and forth to kind of perceive where the next attack is coming from. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks for listening to House on Carrion Hill and House of Bob. If you want to support us, please give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can find us on social media at the House of Bob. Feel free to join us on the Discord where you can chat with members of the show as well as the rest of the cast and many other of our listeners. You can always support us on Patreon and we'd like to thank everybody who's supporting us on Patreon today. Those people are Patrick Hegarty, Brandon Knox, Ron Sonius, Team Eamon, Pavel Lishin, Christine Braille, Tom Inns, Elias Anderson, Mark Boykin, Mary Margaret, Jessica Colvin, Ray Kearney, Scooter Emerson, Tyler Kay, Josh Jordan, Keith Haddad, Luck at 12, Tom Wesley, Jessica, Kieran, Mike at the Tales of the Glass Guard World podcast, Luke Conroy, and Volt. Art for this episode was done by Sean Makes. You can find them at Sean Makes on Instagram or SeanMakes.com. Editing for this episode is by Astronomic Audio. Music by Mike Hammock. Roll on. Oh, I zoomed out. I did it. You did <laughs> it. Finally. <laughs> Good job, Dan. It's been Dan. quite the journey. <laughs>